have you if all is good you can share the see my shared screen already with the menti.com link and the code um a direct link to this um yeah menti session is also in our collaborative notes document so that document is not really crucial for the session but if people feel like it so i mean feel free to take extra notes pop in stuff in there uh list, list your names but i will in any case so the menti meter will after the session generate a pdf and send it to me and i will upload that and link it to those slides so that we have it as as documentation but any other information that you want to record in this document uh, feel free to do so um yeah so the idea for this session is really for for people who have maybe heard about this fair research software discussion in the past but not really dived into it but would like to be involved in the future to give a kind of a primer what this discussion is actually about so maybe you have only heard about that whole topic in Michelle's keynote before uh, this morning, maybe uh, earlier. And like Michelle also pointed out, there's a lot of um, discussion currently going on with the, with the big international working group and several people involved. So if you feel like this could be interesting for me to join, um, then this might be just a good primer to, to go yeah, to get an impression of what these discussions are actually about. So these discussions are not actually at the beginning anymore. Um, and I would say that these sessions reflect maybe a few of the discussions that we had when this fair research software discussion started. But this is nevertheless good to go through them, I think, to get a feeling of what, what the issues are that we are dealing with. Um, yeah, Neil, if you, I, I see the chat blinking sometimes, but maybe alert me if there's anything uh, that I need to react to, that will be perfect. No problem. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so my my first question in this session to you usually is, in this Mentimeter question, um, yeah, much has been said about the fair fair data principles, um, and they are really everywhere, funders require them. You have probably heard about that, but I'm a bit curious here. So would you say you're you're familiar with these fair data principles? Extremely, not at all. Um, have you heard about FAIR? Have you tried to make your data FAIR? Whatever, on this scale. I think people never dare really to say extremely familiar, <laughs> but I see you're a bit more on the familiar side. You're on your unfamiliar side. And I also don't want to really do a big lecture on fair data principles in the session, of course, but I get do the impression so you have probably heard about them, read about something like this, but not having dived too deep in their applications and the details and technicalities of what that entails. But I think that it, that is a, is a good basis for, for this session. Um, yeah, as a, as a very short recap, so if you want to read up a bit uh, on this later, there's a kind of like one page summary from the GoFair initiative, gofair.org, fair principles that summarize them on one, well, not A4, but on one web page that really gives a high level view of what the fair principles are. And also, as so often, um, it's more tailored towards a data perspective. And the examples that are given are very much on data. On a high level, it sounds as if it could apply to, to all kind of research objects, but as we also Michelle was highlighting this morning, this is not necessarily a given and it's not always straightforward to, to apply these fair data principles also to, to software. Right, mm. maybe a few words introduction is also partially again repeating what was said this morning. So we have these fair principle, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, which we also sometimes call the fair from the four foundational fair principles and saying these are really the big four ideas but if you go to the to the guiding principles paper or to this go fair website for example you see that these are many like sub principle examples of what aspect this translates to um and we can kind of feel that okay on this this abstract level the the big four ones they they apply um to to software as well, but if you look in the examples or sub principles that were given and developed with, with data in mind, they don't always fit. But the interesting thing is that the, the 2016 paper, the initial one, stated from the beginning that the FAIR principles are meant not only for data, but for all kinds of software. And this was also recognized already in 2018 by, by the European Commission. 
uh, let's say it's, it's fair digital objects, not only um, data, but also software workflows, other digital resources. And meanwhile, I mean, it's also applied to, to physical resources, actually. So it really doesn't stop there. Um, yeah, but the question we set out with was, okay, how do these FAIR principle relate to software? And we, we started by really see, looking at this mismatch between this broad intentions of the FAIR, of the four foundational principles, F, A, I, and R, and then how these FAIR guiding principles for data were communicated and perceived. So that was a bit of our, our starting point. Um, yeah, and I should emphasize again, so it's, a, it's an ongoing discussion, and I dare to say that the, the uh, paper that we released last year, also with Neil as one of the, the co-authors, was kind of like a, like a milestone in this discussion in the sense that it summarized these first thoughts that we had, but it was not at all um, the definite suggestions of the, of the FAIR software principles. I mean, that's really ongoing. Um, more results are now being published from the other working groups and there is kind of hope um, that we will have something like a draft for a definite set of fair principles in, in the summer. Um, but the, the plan for this session is very much to get into some of the thoughts and ideas that we described in this first, first paper to set the, set the direction of, that this was discussion would take. Um, afterwards. So my first question uh, to you, and this is like free text, a Mentimeter input, um, what is actually data? How would you define it in a, well, let's say, sentence or one and a half sentences? Evidence, nice. Standardized information. Inputs and outputs, so this is a very software on oriented view on data, definitely. Piece of information, information, information again, <laughs> more information. Measure of something, yeah, that is often also named because like data as facts that have been measured, yeah. Metadata is also data, good remark. Not, not the definition, but it's it's good. A digital any digital artifact. Yeah, I guess that's a very technical perspective as well. Mm -hmm. Knowledge can be what knowledge can be constructed from. So again, like basic facts, this worked. Measurements and measurements about the measure, measurements. All right, can I see this here? It's auto scrolling. Okay, plenty of non digital data exists as well for sure. Yeah, we also usually tend to look a, a lot at the at the digital data in, in research, but there's a, or in, in this community, I guess, but there's plenty of non-digital digital data around, completely agree. Yeah, thanks for these answers. Of course, there is no, no right or wrong about this really, but what you can uh, see a bit that some, um, yeah, some people take a more high level view about like what the nature of data is as being like facts, information, measurements, and there's uh, some other comments that um, yeah, to take a bit more technical perspective in the sense if you call it a digital artifact or um, yeah, inputs and outputs of software that refers a bit more to yeah, how this is represented maybe in a, in a computer or something. Okay, we will come back to that. Um, but my next question is then, when we now have an idea what is data, what is then software? takes a bit longer and have indeed more often seen people thinking a bit longer about this one. You know, analyze, generate or consume data. Yeah, the black box in between input and output. Uh, I like the picture though I would hope that it's not always a black box. Set of instructions, yeah. That a computer does on some data. Computer code, algorithm, software is active. Mm -hmm. 
automated process, implementation, task automation. Tool that help find results. Yeah, it's a software tool can certainly do that. All right, well, we're waiting for more input. This is certainly also again, there's no not one right and wrong, right or wrong answer to this. Um, but you see, yeah, it's it's a lot about software that does something. Instructions in a machine is a bit again a bit more technical view while a view on software that's say a tool that helps to find results, uh, a black box between inputs and outputs, again, maybe more a bit of a high level conceptual thing of what um, what software is. The flexible part of a computer, I also like, like this one. Yeah, formalization of computational methods. Yeah, the coding is very much a formalization part. Whereas on paper, it's, it's maybe not very formal. Good, thanks. I mean, the interesting thing with this, we run similar sessions before and the definitions we get are always a bit different. We, I like this. Okay, the, ne the next question, maybe you have anticipated something like that. Um, I'm, I've asked about data and software and now the question is, what do they actually have in common? And uh, please wait a bit with the differences because that will be the next question. But um, yeah, commonalities of data and software. And again, feel free to take a more technical or a bit more conceptual perspective. That's both fine and both relevant for the discussion. Yeah, versioning we have. And biases based on humans and produce them. Not sure I understood the point, but maybe whoever wrote it can unmute and explain. I have an owner licensing metadata at risk of deletion. That's true. I always have the feeling that nowadays everything gets copied so much that actually nothing can really get lost, but I think it, indeed it can happen. They can change. Yeah, that's an interesting one. And also important one, need each other for sure. Important research outputs. Yeah. And you would hope that they would all be equally recognized, which is not the case, but they, they are. Painful if not dealt with correctly, that's certainly true. Um, they're both soft in the sense that they're easy to share and modify. They have dependencies, yeah, although usually the dependencies for software tend to be a larger issue. Models of the world, that's also a nice one. Required for reproducibility, for sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. This is a bit of a less technical perspective than we saw with the definitions. But for sure, these are all valuable perspectives. Okay, now the other question, the announced one is really, what makes data and software different? First answer in software has more dependencies. I tend to agree to that one. Yeah. Software is active. That's also something that's often named as opposed to data really yeah, being static in the sense that it's, it's not actively itself doing anything. Software is modified more often than data. That's probably true, at least for research data. Although there are, of course, data that's, if you think of big data that is collected from web platforms that can be highly dynamic. Um, yeah, but for research data, I think that tends to be that tends to be true. Software is data plus an active process. Yeah, I mean, software is usually interesting if it does something on data. Yeah, data is privacy is issues. Software not so much. Data is static. Yeah, data is usually very large and hard to store. Yeah, software can also be large-ish, but maybe indeed not as much as data can be uh, data can be consumed in many ways software ages faster than data yeah i think the decay and not being able to run software is more more of a problem than being able to all open all data files again 
it is a measurement software as a process that re again refers to the interactive part. Software is harder to standardize. I think that's a nice discussion point. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is actually the, the case. I think I tend to agree, but maybe we just, the community has not met so much process in this. Yeah, but software is a living, living artifact. Living again in the sense that uh, software stops working. Yeah. They just give more emphasis in academic publications than software. Yeah, and although, I mean, the, the data is getting attention in academic publications is already good progress and achievement, but yeah, it would be great if software would also get that recognition sometime soon. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, usually someone, and, and I think today no one has posted this, um, someone comments at this point that, yeah, software, is just a just a special kind of data because that is something that many people kind of learn in computer science classes at some point, and indeed it's it is kind of true from a from a technical perspective, um, and this is something that we really dealt with and struggled with a bit in the in the beginning of the discussion. So do we see really software as a special kind of data or not? So what this would mean in in a computer system ultimately everything is represented as data in the sense of being sequences as ones and of ones and zeros, potentially very long ones, um, but ones and zeros. And in a computer, yeah, theoretical computer science or, or basic computer science, you would say, yeah, everything in a computer is data. Information is data, instructions for software is data, everything that you could think of is ultimately data. And in that sense, certainly uh, software would just be a special kind of data. Yeah, but for, for the FAIR software discussion, we really didn't help find this perspective very, very helpful. And if we leave that technical perspective for, for a moment and look more and you could say uh, conceptual or domain oriented um, perspective, we get this one. So that the um, FAIR discussion talks about the digital object or the digital research object as the, the common thing, the common superclass, common. Um, category for everything, and then data, software, algorithms, workflows, all research objects are like, yeah, digital objects next to each other, rather than the one being a special case of the other. And we just found this um, perspective much more helpful for the for the FAIR software discussion, because FAIR is about the, the domain and the perspectives of research and not so much about how things are represented in a computer. So this is also a bit the perspective that we're going to follow in the following. Um, yeah, another discussion point that we really had in, in the discussion was, okay, what research software? Um, we kind of agreed on a working definition, and I should mention that in the um, FAIR for Research Software Working Group, there's uh, currently a subgroup um, focusing on really to define what research software is and in particular what research software entails in the context of FAIR software. But for the moment, just like let's agree that research software comes in many forms for many purposes and across many distribution channels. And also traditionally in the scientific community, there has been a lot of free and or open source software, so FOSS. Mm. So FAIR and FOSS, how do they relate to each other? So we, we quickly saw that there's a clear overlap of objectives on, on the high level, but they're, they're really not the same. And um, one of the major reasons for not being the same is that FOSS is essentially about open source code and open licenses. Whereas FAIR, if you look at that paper, like open data is not a requirement. Um, and that comes, um, so the, the, the accessible principle states that it needs to be clear how data can be accessed, but it's, it's not um, a requirement per se that that is open. Um, and that has good reasons and has to do with, for example, privacy and sensitivity concerns that you would have with, with health uh, research data, pa patients' health records, for example. But as someone was also pointing out earlier in, in, the, in the differences, um, these privacy concerns are not in the same way, way valid for research software because the, the software as such is the instructions, but not the data. And you can 
uh, even if, if you have software for privacy um, sensitive data that can be completely open and non-critical. And more stronger, you could even uh, say there is a demand to make methods available because it's important for reproducibility. So software, it should be open. Um, yeah, so the, it's a bit ongoing. Again, discussion should fair software also require the software to be open. Um, and at this point, I would again like to hear your opinion on this. So what do you think? Should FAIR uh, for, for software require open licenses and why or why not? Do you think it's a good idea <laughs> to deviate from uh, the FAIR data formulation here or not? Okay, first answer is already a compromise, en encourage, but not, do not require. Uh, the next one is a, is a no, because closed software would benefit from being fair uh, too. So it should not require, yeah. So yeah, fair for software is still useful, even if only metadata is available. That's another statement. Strongly suggested, so we have two Compromise, if research is still reproducible, not a problem. Yeah, you could, for example, of course, also imagine that a, uh, that the software is not open source, but freely available, then it, it might still be reproducible. This would be another in-between solution, let's say. Then someone saying open licenses should be the default. And if they don't do it, they should justify why this is the case. Yeah. It's also goes, it's a bit stronger than encouraging really, um, or only encouraging making things fair, or making things open. Yes, as a default that goes in the a, in a same direction and with clear guidance on how things can be fair if they are closed source. Yeah. In a fair, this is within an institution, particularly large. What does in a fair mean? Maybe whoever posted that explain. So it basically means following the fair principles, but instead of publishing publicly, you do it only in institutional archives. Oh, right. So this use, for instance, Microsoft works like that, like they have inner open source. So they share all the code within the organization, following the same principles. And you can say the same for inner fair principles mm -hmm. and that you can share within your the people who have still access to things that otherwise should be restricted. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, that might be an interesting, like, solution or compromise for many of the, um, for many organizations indeed. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for those answers. Also, interesting. Um, one last thing. Oh, one last discussion point that I want to highlight in in this uh, session today is that of fair and software quality how do they to go together i mean as soon as you start to talk about software um to your research software engineers rses the topic of quality comes up and the question here was really can fair meet the expectations and there were quickly always like people giving examples of yes fair can can cover this and this is like a quality checklist or people were coming with example where they said, no, I mean, FAIR does not cover this and this is really important for software quality. So FAIR, FAIR is not good for that. Um, and then at some point we found it just helpful to distinguish really clearly between, between form and function of software. So what we mean by that, the, the form is really, I mean, the, the piece of code when you, when you look at it, um, you can look at the documentation, you can look at the coding style, you can look at, yeah, how the things are set up, how maintainable code is really as, as, a, uh, as an artifact. And the functionality is the point when software starts executing and starts to get active because then you have other problems and you worry about functional correctness, for example, about security, about performance, efficiency. And we, we found that the, these quality of the form, this is something that really can 
be covered by FAIR, because FAIR is very much about how you provide a certain artifact and what information you give around that. Um, whereas the, what, what the software does when it's run is not so easy, they covered by the FAIR principles. And if you think of it, that's also actually true for data. So FAIR data principles do not say anything about the content quality of the data. It's really only principles that say what is good practice in, in how data are shared and provided. Um, and that applies to software as well. And we could just say, okay, we, we only focus on the form and for FAIR, we don't care about what, what the functionality is. Um, yeah, this is the, the really last question to you in, in this session. Do you think that that's a good decision or not? So should FAIR also take content quality into account or not? And this question also applies not only to software, but also to data. So is it enough for FAIR to really focus on the form of how it's been shared? Um, or is it not sufficient? Should it also be extended to some say something about the quality? Yeah? At the moment, it's the case you can comp have completely rubbish data and it can be, can be completely FAIR. But it might, from a scientific perspective, it might be pretty useless. Um, it could you reuse it and you would pretty soon discover that's not useful for you. So is that desirable or, or rather not? Just a little time warning, Annalena. We've got uh, three minutes left in this yes, session. Yes, perfect. But we are, we will be done after this. <laughs> Thanks. Right, so the first answer we get here are clear no's. <laughs> Please keep to that. Should be determined through peer review. Should be opinion of the consumer, not the creator. And maybe it's also highly context dependent. Yeah, that brings in the idea of data software peer review. So yeah, useful to keep the concept separate. Yeah, definitely having minimum code and data quality standards would be good. So I completely agree to that, but uh, maybe it's, it's something in addition to FAIR and not, not part of the FAIR principles. Best practices are important. Yeah, and one, we have one yes here saying, okay, reusability requires a minimum content quality threshold. So we should have that. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm leaving here. Thanks again for, for the answers here. As I said, I will download the Mentimeter PDF after the session and link it um, link it to, to our collaborative note document so that if you wanna refer to this afterwards, it will be, be available. Um, more things, so Collaborations Workshop 21 is really heavy on uh, FAIR software. It's, it's been a theme. Uh, it was this morning in parallel, there is now a session on how fair is your research software. So if you were here, you will have missed that, but I'm sure that people will be happy to, to tell you more about the how fair is tool also afterwards. And tomorrow there's at least two other workshops on fair for software. And especially the yeah, 2.1, I think Moran is going to give an overview about like latest developments and really recent discussion results. And now you're really prepped for following those as well. And for sure, there's a, not everything. So this list is not complete. There will always be also be a bit of fair for research software in the hack day and discussion sessions. Um, yeah, and if you're really curious to, to join officially, there is the um, fair for research software working group that also Michelle um, introduced this morning. So feel free to join that if you're interested in the discussion. And then for that, thanks for, for joining this one and enjoy yeah, whatever will be your next session, next activity here. And thank you so much, Annalena, for that great session. Uh, let's give her a virtual round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>